we didn't feel that constant like urgency at yeah. every second of our lives. Right. And so we could just sit back and watch a little guy Jingumba. <laughs> right, a little little a little armless creature wield his katana and strike <laughs> through cultural ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> oh how times have changed. <laughs> Welcome to GT Not Live, where today we're going to take you back to the past. That was my bad rendition of the opening line of the Angry Video Game Nerd uh, theme song for anyone who remembers uh, good old James Rolfe. But um, today is very much a retrospective day. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, I, maybe it's just me because, you know, these are our channels. But lately, YouTube has been serving up uh, a lot of small creators who have been doing videos on the history of the game theorists. Um, doing kind of like talking points of the things that we've done, like some of the achievements when we launched channels, things like that. But also stuff like, hey, there were these shows that once existed on the game theorist channel and also film theorists, that's why they're called the theorists, that don't exist anymore and have been disappeared and for years, and you, maybe you've never heard of them, and that's kind of cool. And in the comments I'll read, I've been watching a lot of these, these are fun. I, I like seeing what people have to say about kind of like the evolution of the channel and stuff. Um, yeah, I like to watch people talk about me. Uh, but it's it's been really fun to watch and to reflect on this stuff. And a lot of the comments are like, oh, I had no idea that these shows existed. And I guess at this point, it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, for the last three, four years, at least, we haven't had many partner shows on except for the science at this point. And so today, I actually thought it would be fun to do kind of like a nostalgia trip backward and spotlight some of the the, the partner shows. I, I think we've got almost all of them pulled up. Uh at least, you know, a, a couple moments from all these different shows that have appeared on the channel over the years. See how much times have changed. Uh, and, and also, in general, uh, see where they are now. Because I think that would be fun to say, like, hey, so these were what was being produced at the time. And now, where are they do what are they up to these days? Um, so that's the plan. Uh, I, th I think that'll be fun. I don't know. <laughs> it'll, it'll be a nice walk down nostalgia lane for me. It's, it's also funny, too, because... Um, you know, in my wider life, I've been digging through, like, old emails and stuff, and I'm, like, looking at the old, old, like, first emails that I, I had reaching out to, like, Gaijin Goomba back in the day, who we're going to talk about. Um, reaching out to him and, and seeing, like, hey, I've got this idea. Why don't we all, like, partner on the same channel and, you know, we can all grow together faster and this and that. We'll, we'll do all the business stuff and whatever. It's so funny to look back. Uh, Ash! Have you seen any of the, like, other shows on the Game Theorist channel? Like, I know that you've watched some of our stuff before. Did you ever see any of the old, like, digressing and side questing or crossover or anything? Yeah, I've seen um, digressing and side questing. Um, I watched when A Brief History was on yeah, Game Theorist. Yeah, uh -huh. Good old foot of a ferret. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, you know, meeting Ryder was really wild yeah. for that purpose. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I think those were the two I was most familiar with. Cool. Well, there you, there you go. So let's, let's open up the doors and show you, like, the, the interesting history. And I think best place to start is actually with the most recent one. Um, the, the one, I guess if this was a game of Survivor, the one who has, has lasted of everyone, which is Austin from The Science, uh, who is still airing on the channel. So, uh, this is his most recent video, Your Flying City is Impossible, The Science of Tower of Fantasy. I, and let, let me say this, too. Um, you don't have to go wide to me. This is, this is fine. I can still be in picture in picture. They see enough of my face. It's, it's too much. Um, I haven't seen this. And, and I think it's important to just know that for the most part with the with the partner shows they have always been done with people who are not like full time working with with me with the theorist team it they have always been third party like create just creators who are like running their own businesses their own separate things a lot of them have their own channels and we especially in the early days it was like hey you have a cool show that is educational 
you know, science oriented, gaming oriented, you have a visual style that kind of matches game theory visual style, come on, we will be able to like give you hopefully more views than what you're getting on your channel. We'll monetize better uh, because we're in like a, a, the like special tier of the partner program where we're like a, a very high trusted partner at, at YouTube, this and that. And so like you make more money, you get more views off of your stuff and you just get a wider platform for your stuff. And that was awesome. Um, and that was, but at the end of the day, like when it makes sense for us to kind of like part ways or whatever, like totally fine, you keep everything, all yours. Um, and that's how it's always been. And so the idea here, so the reason I bring that up is one, to give you an idea of how this all works, but also very, very rarely did I ever have to hop in or like give any notes or say like, hey, this, this doesn't fly. And so a lot of times, like I, I, haven't, I haven't seen this. So it, it'll be good to see what we're actually putting up on the channel. Cause you know, I'll pop into every like, maybe like, third, every third Austin video uh, to see what he's been up to. So I actually haven't gotten to see Austin in a while. So this will actually be exciting for me to see. So uh, Science Tower <sighs> Fantasy. What? Is it, oh, oh crap. Is, it, is it that time? It's to, to do a video like <laughs> I'm not playing. Um. <clears throat> maybe, maybe, maybe I should talk about this. Thing. So, and again, one of the, one of the things we do at the partner shows is I will, I, every once in a while, I'll, I'll pop in and be like, hey, here's some suggestions for stuff to do in the future. So, Austin, consider this, consider this me telling you how to do this faster. Welcome to YouTube in, in 2022, where having, like... Uh, uh, Tanya, please turn the fake camera off, please! A 15-second intro that leads to... The... <laughs> 15 second intro of like, I'm not prepared for this. Maybe, maybe it doesn't work. It's a little bit different from the whole like, today we're doing this and this is our thesis statement right at the beginning. Hi, hello, it is me, Austin, <laughs> the definitely prepared guy. Oh, great. I have still definitely on. not been distracted playing Tower of Fantasy <laughs> under the guise of research. Um, <clears throat> anyway, Hot of Studio and Level Infinite recently approached me and was like, hey, would you like to come to a sponsored video for our game Tower of Fantasy? <laughs> we great. have a new version update coming out and i was like all right well give me a minute i'll just uh what i get to make my own waifu oh heck yes <laughs> <Except> to... <laughs> do you dear dear internet ash do you follow austin on twitter at all uh uh i do his, do you his private account i am on there yeah yeah i don't think he realizes that i follow him <laughs> Because he hasn't followed me back, but... <laughs> but you're, you're, you're sneaking, out, you're sneaking <laughs> into his DMs. Yeah. Uh, you're watching. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't... Again, I try to stay off of social media these days, but I, but that was one of those things where I'm like, Austin, you're like the thirstiest man I know. <laughs> like, there was a period of time, like, in the middle of... Like, he had joined the channel. He'd been on with us for a while. And I started to, like, just be flooded with his tweets. And all of them... <laughs> are like just the thirstiest stuff ever. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm, like, I'm seeing things that I probably shouldn't be seeing. <laughs> yeah, he's, 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 got, he's got himself a spicy Twitter thread. Oh, it is sure. spicy. Spicy, yeah. He's, oh yes. He, he, he's very online uh, and he's very eager to share all of, his, all of his favorite images from being online. So anyway, this line, <laughs> that ain't a joke. <laughs> like, I, I don't think that's a joke. I have a quick question. Yeah, what's up? Um, who's the child that Austin <laughs> imposes himself onto? That's a great question, Ash. <laughs> I, I think it's a meme. Isn't it, isn't it like the pointing kid meme? I think it's a pointing kid meme that he, he puts himself on. Nice. I'm almost, a po I, I'm almost positive. It'd be cool if it was like the young Ed Krause. Oh, the early, the early Ed Krause. And he evolves into Ed Krause <laughs> that appears in game theory. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> It's him as a child. But again, you, you start to see, like, why, you know, why Austin's style appeals to us, right? It's like, he is a PNG tuber, like, you know, I tend to be, in episodes Game Theory, PNG tuber. And so, like, even though we're not doing the same show, we're doing a similar enough vibe that it's like, oh, as a channel of educational, you know, critical gaming commentary or video essays about gaming with an educational lean or whatever, it fits into that box both aesthetically and and stylistically. So, anyway, that's that's what it is. Uh, I'll, I'll have more on saying that. Professionally than that, I think. I don't remember. 
Anyway, the game is I a lot of fun, game. but what specific? I, I I love I love the style and I love the format. I also, he got rid of the deer tower. Fa he, the huh, that's interesting because his whole thing at the beginning of every episode was deer so and so. Like he was writing an open letter to them. I didn't know that he got rid of that. I think I talked to him about starting episodes faster. So apparently he got rid of the like dear so and so and replaced it with let let me do like the equivalent of the John Tron hacking call <laughs> for a minute. Great. <laughs> My notes might have been misinterpreted there. Specifically I want to take a look at in the terms of science is something we've never looked at on this show before. Which is this. How on earth that do you cool. make a city flow? Like the Luxor. At, in, that's like the Luxor in, the, in Egypt. Or not Luxor, not Egypt. Uh, in Las Vegas. This city. Mirror. Giant floating casino. You see, floating cities are a staple in games since like, um, well, basically since we've had graphics. Probably since before there were graphics. In any case, floating cities are all over Tower of... <laughs> the aesthetics of the, uh, <laughs> the frame. I get it, but also we can move on. Fantasy. There's High Cross, your home base. There's Cetus Island, the amusement park thing. There's this, game, this thing near Cetus Island. And on Artificial Island, there's like half a dozen floating platforms. But the one I want to take a look <laughs> there at are. today... I've never really stopped to think about that, but it's true. Like, there's a lot of floating platforms in video games. Just un unexplained. They just exist. That's fine. That's That's actually one of the reasons why I really like... And, and one of the reasons why I've, I've been really happy to have Austin on the team for as long as he's been, um, because, you know, for all you longtime viewers of Game Theory, you'll know that, like, our earliest episodes were more science-based and less lore-based. Like, we, we divide up our episodes mentally in a lot of different buckets. Um, and so it's one of those things where, in a lot of different buckets, but like one of the broad categories is science episodes versus lore episodes. And obviously nowadays we do a lot more lore episodes because that's what you guys have said like you really enjoy right now. But back in the day it was a lot of like Minecraft diamond armor and how much does it cost or can Mario break a block with his, you know, with his just jumping power. Um, a little bit more into the science, a little bit less in the lore. My favorite episodes are the ones that fuse them together, right? Um... But as we lean more into the lore, I'm like, hey, I want a show that still maintains, especially for the old, old, oldest subscribers to the channel, like that really hard science bent. And, and you know, Austin's show has always been much deeper into the science, and, and he can go really deep into like the quantum mechanics and this and that uh, than we ever tended to do. So that's why he kind of like rounds out the channel programming. I think in my ideal world, you know, he would just come aboard and we would do, you know, he would do, like, just help me write science episodes of game theory, um, you know, and then we'd just do a bunch of game theories of it, but, you know, he's, he's doing this thing I'm happy for. It is all the way in the land of Vera, the new zone in Tower of Fantasy. It's like this mad maxi desert place, but what's most interesting to me is this, Mororia, a floating pyramid-shaped cyberpunk city in the middle of the desert map. It's enormous. Cool. We've talked about flotation and stuff on this channel before, but not exactly in this way. So let's get right down to brass tacks. So you'll want to float a city and here's why you shouldn't. Floating is a very- <laughs> And, and this, that was always the thing that people leveled against us is like, why would you do real world science with fictional things? It's like, because it's fun. Because why not? A very it's cool. easy thing to describe in simple terms. We are on a planet. Planets are big, heavy. They have mass. The existence of mass <laughs> in a space creates a force that around these parts we like to call gravity. There's lots of explanations for why gravity exists, but that part isn't actually that important for this video. Just assume that it does. Gravity can be described, <laughs> I think, cool. in simple terms as a massive object pulling something toward it. This is the force that keeps us glued to the that surpasses whatever the force of gravity Ooh, some, pulling something them happened over here that people now, got excited about. In the past, we have talked strictly in the terms of flight and buoyancy which is a force that's created by a voluminous object that is to say an object 
fiends long. So, uh, just imagine that in your head. Way easier to wrap your mind around than football field, isn't it? This is actually pretty enormous. A city block in Manhattan is just 80 meters by 274 meters, but I'm from Chicago, and, uh, we're gonna be using the far superior Chicago and city block of- Wow, feisty! Those be fighting words! Thousand square meters. This makes the footprint of Maroria amount to just over four Chicagoan city blocks, mm. which is a uh, pretty tiny for a That's city, cool. but enormous really if we're talking about lifting something into the sky. And apparently, they're making it bigger in future updates, which is a bold choice if you consider what we're about to do number-wise. The main one, as I see it, is accounting for this pyramid dome thing, which honestly probably amounts to only one percent of the total mass of the thing. But what, what's more interesting than what? that is the buildings on this thing that don't just go up, they go down as well. Which makes sense, right? You have- See, but this this is the source that, like, again, this this is old school game theory for me. Like, the, you know, both in editing style and in terms of, like, subject matter, right? Where it's like, we're gonna dive into the nitty gritty and show you each element of these calculations bit by bit, piece by piece, like- Let's break down the the volume equation for a giant pyramid like that. And then you have to break down pixel measurements of how, that, how tall that is. Or we're hopping into the game to see, like, how many floors does that building have? Let's look at the number of windows, things like that. So that way, let's find a rough real-world equivalent for that sort of thing. So that way we can translate it into, into the real world. Um, or real world equivalents so we can translate into the world of the game and then make rough mathematical estimates. Like, that's the sort of stuff that I really dig. Um, and again, like, I wish we had the ability, <laughs> like, time in my life to do more episodes of game theory where we could balance out lore and science um, just on a more regular basis. And I think that gets to kind of the, the trick of all of this before we hop to the next one. I think that's good for, for Austin. This is, this is cool. Um, meters or 320,000 HP oh, Sailor Moon reference, okay. <laughs> to 16 stacked on top of one another. And Tanya, don't you dare be trying to animate that using 320,000 of anything. You're going to melt your processor in what? What? At your thinnest dimension, you're going to have a one pixel to work with, which means most. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about it, great. Awesome. Um, so, but yeah, so, I, and I think that, that goes to the, the point that I was about to say here, which is. Um, the reason a lot of these shows have aren't on the channel anymore, like one, they've either gone off to, to break off into their own thing, you know, and they're like, hey, I, I want to really kind of carve off my brand for myself or kind of like grow my own channel, you know, now that I've gotten an audience here, let me move some of them over here so I can get started. Um, or alternatively, and the bigger issue too is like for the channel at this point, YouTube is so much about balance and are you rising or are you falling? Are you rising or are you falling? And since Game Theory is the show that most of the people subscribed to this channel, tuning into this channel regularly, are tuning in for, we have to maintain, like, hey, we have to get so many Game Theories for every, you know, science video or X number of Game Theories for every partner show, right? And that ratio has has had to increase over time as YouTube has gotten more and more stringent about, like, you only have this big of a window, and are you rising or are you falling? Um, and so it's it's been this tricky balance, and even within game theory, right? It's it's a balancing act between like the topics that we're covering. You know, like for every five nights, at, for every you know random episode about small game acts like Evertale or Tower of Fantasy or you know Merge Mansion or whatever, which may or may not do well, we don't know. We have to balance it out with like some of the bigger names, like a Minecraft or a Fortnite or something that we know is going to keep us in the algorithm. And so it's this constant ebb and flow, not just within the partner shows in game theory, but also within game theory itself and the subject matters that we're, we're choosing, which is hard. And that's gotten only increasingly harder as YouTube has evolved, um, which is why, you know, there's there's also been fewer partner shows on the channel. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the unfortunate thing. I wish you could still run the channel as a channel rather than as a show. And I think because YouTube is so primed into, oh, it's a it's a personality-based platform, you know, and so like, oh, it's it's always gonna be laser beam and he is the common thread through all of this. You know, I think it's harder as people who create formats and as people who kind of host shows, you know, I think it's harder for us to, you know, find that balance and, and find continued success. But fortunately we've been able to do it over these years. That being said, so this is so this is the most recent partner show. Um, most recent episode of most recent partner show, and I I love Austin. Um, 
I'm, I'm happy with all, all our guys. But I think from here, what's the next one? Yes! Okay, so this is one that I don't think anyone really remembers or necessarily knows. Um, it was, I, I think also maybe our shortest series. No, there was one that was shorter, which we'll get back to. Uh, this was, this was our shortest run series, Chiptune Tuesday! Um, probably the largest digression from what the game theorists were. Uh, but I'm like, hey, pixel music is, or not, not pixel music, 8-bit music is awesome. Like, chiptunes are awesome. I love chiptunes, and there's a lot of really amazing artists out there who are doing chiptunes back in the day. And so, even, like, this this conversation was happening right alongside when I reached out to Ronnie and when I reached out to, to Goomba back in the day to, like, hey, come on, come on, bring your show over. Um... This was, I was also reaching out to these chiptunists, specifically uh, Carfi, Spelling Failure, uh, Reco House, Reco Huss, um, who actually, I don't think we ever ended up getting it onto the channel. Um, but back then it was like, hey, every Tuesday we're going to do a cool chiptune just because your music is awesome. I, I love it. People really liked the Game Theory opening theme song. And so let's spotlight more of your work. But that one just, again, like it didn't, resonate with viewers and also it was one of those things where I felt like we weren't doing them due service uh like we weren't able to really deliver them the, the value or kind of like the promise that I, I wanted to to give them you know as far as like more views more more monetization whatever um and so that one ended up just being very short-lived but here it is. I mean this is this is the original the original game theory theme song before like, all the covers and this and that And then there's... It's like, well, how do we visualize this? Because that's the other, you know, we were just editing this in our in the background. So it's like, how do we visualize this? I'll just, you know, change the color slider every once in a while. But what more do you need, right? There you go. Here's the drop. Let's go. Yes. Okay. Oh, man, the cell hit hard. Yeah! Okay. Oh, man, that's a, that's a blast from the text. <laughs> yes! Oh, back before there were any other colors to add to the logo. And then it cycles again. That's, ah, oh, so good. And then uh, the other, so that was Spelling Failure, um, who I think went on to do, let's see, can I, let's see, let's X out of here, because I know we have a couple more. Spelling Failure, I think he did, what else did he do? Um, SoundCloud, yeah. So, yeah, so, and then we, let's see, we, so this is Spelling Failure. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know how long he went on to do this, but yeah, he did his chiptunes. He did a bunch of other music for a, a, quite a while. Ten years ago, nine years ago, ten, so six, six years ago. Right, but like, there's so much talent online, and I'm like, why... Why not have a chance to spotlight so much of it? So that way they can then do their own work and we're all able to do the things that we're passionate about. It was just awesome to be able to, to meet and work with these people in the earliest days of their careers, right? And then this was Carfi, who is also amazing. This one was a little bit easier because we had like a, I'm like, oh, this is kind of like Castlevania and spooky. You guys have just come up with all of these. He, uh, Carfi did the Deadlock theme song. Uh, he did a couple themes actually for Deadlock, which was our main show. But like the level of, one of the things I loved about Carfi's work was the level of tension that he's able to build in his music. You have this kind of like exciting drama that builds in them. Um, he had a couple songs that really, when he worked on Deadlock uh, for us, I asked him to like design music that was really inspired by Phoenix Wright, which I figured you would appreciate. Yes. Um, oh no, let's see, Carfi. I know for a while it was Carfi Dark, Carf Darko, and then it wasn't, and then 
but like so he again like many years ago I don't know what he's gone to do but just awesome to see and you, you see like everyone's production value getting better too like I mean we're talking this is I mean, if you're looking for quality musicians and amazing music tracks, these guys are incredible. And the chiptune community is so awesome. Um, it's, it's, again, it's one of those things that I wish could still survive in, in modern YouTube, and it's been hard to do. But the, yeah, we're talking nine years ago. So we went from like literally a week ago, pretty much, to like nine years ago, which is crazy. So Chiptune Tuesday, that was fun. Uh, sadly, too short-lived. And, you know, please support the Chiptune community because there's so much awesome 8-bit style, like, retro music out there. Uh, moving on to Goomba. I think this is Goomba, yeah. Game Exchange. Uh, so for those who don't remember, this is 10 years ago. Wow. Wow. We're so old. Oh man, Grandpa YouTube over here. Wow. I mean, I'm I'm no Rhett and Link, but I'm close, man. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. What? Drag them. No, ah, they 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 they've they've been on the platform for like what, 15, 16 years at this point. I mean, yeah, they do kind of like brand themselves. Yeah, like the cool dads. Of they're, no, they're the cool dad. Like. And, and you can tell how long a person's been on the platform because you see how fluffy and, and tall my hair is. It's it's very fluffy and tall, but not nearly as fluffy and tall as Link's hair. At this Link's hair is literally like a giant tidal wave, like a tsunami wave over oh, the top yeah. of his head. Every time I see him, his hair has gotten like taller and taller. So I'm, I'm approaching Link level, but not quite there. Rhett and Link represent like the two directions your hair can go if you're on YouTube. <laughs> it's true. That's, true. That's actually exactly right. You have Rhett, which is just like, I am now like wild you know man versus wild yeah uh survivor man full beard mountain man giant hair or you have the link which is just like the the hair wall which progressively gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger yeah so like examples you would be a link mm -hmm. anthony padilla would be a red that's actually very true yeah i like it it's, it's a great point <laughs> are you <laughs> two two roads diverged i chose the one less traveled that's not true i chose the one chosen by most most vloggers, I guess. I was doing the hair wall before all of you. There it is. Never had. I've gotten like a new haircut once, and that's ever since I started getting the like shaved stuff, and that was thanks to the St. Jude. Uh, okay, so Goomba. Again, one of the first partner shows on the channel, and it started with Game Exchange, right? So uh, I saw Goomba and Ronnie. Uh, well, Ronnie reached out to me, uh, but Goomba I saw, and he had a show that was like, oh, you're talking about like teaching culture through the lens of gaming and like how different games reflect culture. That's awesome. I love that idea. Um, I have a show that teaches like science through gaming. And so let's, let's collaborate, you know, come on, be a, be a show on the channel and we're going to be able to like share audience and stuff. So here it is. I don't know which one this one is. Japanese culture and Kirby Mario and Zelda. Oh, this might've been like one of the first ones. Oh wow. Karibo shoe. Yeah. For a while. What was that? I mean, this is, this is, it's funny, because this is, I mean, this was back in the day before you, all of us were like, yeah, you, we're going to post our videos on YouTube, YouTube's our hosting site, but like, we're going to put them on external websites, because that's where the audiences are, um, you know, and so we might be able to get more views at thepunkfect.com or screwattack.com, or, you know, I think that was, Karibo Shu was Ronnie and, and Goomba, and I forget who were trying to build their own website, for themselves equivalent like this was again the era of like you went to websites to talk about retro games and go to the th the forums and the threads to talk um watch the videos and down in the comments there that's what you had it you didn't do that sort of thing on youtube and then eventually people figured out oh yeah but like youtube is you do the videos and the comments all at the same time like that's that's easier that's probably the best why would we go to somewhere else oh man i think this was uh was this this composition, I think, was either car for spelling failure as well. Like, th those guys worked w w with us on a lot of these, you know, on a lot of our shows whenever we needed music. Oh, man. Nice, <laughs> nice ninja guy back in the day. I love it. Oh, th this aesthetic, too, of this reminds me of Hungry Lamu. Like, I mean, back in the day, right? The, the like, kind of like flash animation, very simple keyframing stuff. 
Oh man, is, I'm assuming since this is probably an early episode of Game Exchange, this is gonna be get it Game Exchange because it's like you know exchange student Game Exchange, but also you're exchanging games. That was Stephanie. Um, she's like, hey, because it was Gaijin Gamer, I think, back in the day. I, again, I I need to refresh myself on the history, but I think it was Gaijin Gamer back in the day, and we're like, no one knows what Gaijin Gamer means. Like, what's Gaijin mean? Um, you know, or at least we understand, but it's hard to spell and this and that. Game exchanged. It's punny, but it works. Um, I'm assuming this is this high-pitched voice. With your host! Gaijin Gamer. I love how slower paced everything is. It's wild to look at the pacing. I mean, granted, this is 10 years ago, but you look at, like, early YouTube videos, and it's like, oh, yeah, you know. Here's the extended intro sequence. Let's just take a minute and a half to, you know, it wasn't milking it for watch time. It was literally like, this is how a, sh a, a show has an arc and there's a build to it. And here's the opening sequence. Oh, no. We had patience back then. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah, really, before Vine came in, it was like, you only got six seconds. Do a video. Six seconds. You know, TikTok, you get a minute. Whatever. Nowadays, it's like, oh, yeah. Go, go, go. Flash in your face. The attention span just... Yeah. Back then, though, it was like, oh, this is cool. Let's sit back and watch. Yeah. We didn't feel that constant, like, urgency at yeah. every second of our lives. Right? So we could just sit back and watch a little guy Goomba. <laughs> right, a little little a little armless creature wield his katana and strike through cultural ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> oh how times have changed. Oh, oh how times have changed, how the turns have tabled. Hello YouTube and welcome one and all to Game Exchange. Oh my gosh, this is this is even a different voice than I remember. Where we talk about the video games we all love and the mysteries of the culture that not only surround them, but the entire gaming subculture between the US and Japan. I, I love the shifting of it. <laughs> like, eventually, and again, this is, this is obviously like a first episode, right? Because he's like, well, I'm going to game exchange. But like, and we figured this stuff out for the longest time. The game theory logo wasn't centered. The trophy in the center of the game theory logo wasn't actually in the center. And so anytime it would roll, it was kind of like a flat tire. <laughs> it was oh like, do, 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 Don't do. tell me that. Don't tell me that. No, it was. It was oh. for the longest time. Oh, no. Until, until... Pff, probably like five, six years into the show when, when we had, uh, I, I believe it was Thomas, one of our editors, uh, one of our international guys who edits for us, who's incredibly talented. Uh, he's like, this has been driving me nuts for years. Like, why is this not centered? And he's like, I fixed it. And it's like, oh my gosh, I didn't even thank you so much. But yeah, uh, and same thing here, right? You see Goomba kind of like shifting around because, you know, we didn't figure, oh, like, let's just have a similar asset sheet or like a similar sprite sheet that has you in the same position every time and we're just manipulating like the eyes or, you know, the individual like assets of it. We were figuring this stuff out. I also love that it's, they didn't even like cut out, like <laughs> cut out the white. That would be hard though because you got to cut out the white, but if you're using the Photoshop select tool, it's going to select the stripes and then you got to recolor those in. It's a hot mess. Not worth it. In time, I wish to branch off to other countries and cultures, but Japan is my specialty, and that's where I want to focus. So. Yeah, Goomba went through, like, four, I guess, different iterations of the voice. Because th this is his first one. I think then he kind of pitches it to a slightly more mature but still high-pitched one. And then he tried his real voice for a while because people were always like, I hate your voice. And he got a lot of flack for the voice, which it's tricky because I don't mind it, but also people hated my voice, too. So, like, I'm just like, uh, is the information good? Is it, is the audio peaking? No? Yes and no? Great. Awesome. This is a quality video. You guys ready to have your minds blown? I am. Let's begin with Zelda. Believe it or not, there's a bit of Japanese culture behind a few things in this game. Now, we all know Believe it or not. What? There's Japanese culture in Zelda? And again, this, I mean, again, it's, it's funny to think about, but this is 10 years ago, right? And so a lot of the, like, you know, the, the... All of all of retro content hadn't been strip mined for information. Like at this point, you hear. A, I, I, we'll see what factoids are in this one. But like you hear this stuff, and it's like, oh yeah, I've heard this like a dozen times. Or like, of course, like uh, Super Mario Brothers Two was actually a reskin of a game called Doki Doki Panic from Japan. Like everyone knows a lot of this stuff at this point because it's just permeated the cultural consciousness. But back in the day, you know, because it's all been strip mined, right? Like we. <laughs> Got to the bottom of the barrel, and then we dug deeper, and then we, you know, 
<laughs> you like restrip it and resurface it. It's like, okay, we did this again. Um, but back in the day, like this was new information. Like people didn't know this, or at least it wasn't as commonly held beliefs, or it wasn't as, as commonly common knowledge. Moto got his inspiration for the game from exploring the woods at his home. Classic. But would you believe that something so central to the game, the Triforce, actually comes from one of the most powerful families in ancient Japan? Yes, this is the emblem for the Hojo clan. The Hojo clan were the family that held power over Japan as the family of the first shogunate based in Kamakura. Did you know about the Hojo, Hojo clan? See, didn't know about the Hojo clan. Before they came to power, they were fierce enemies of the Taira clan, who battled the Hojo clan over control of the entire country. Their power and influence held from 1138 to 1333. At that time, Great. one of the Hojo's vassals, Ashikaga Takauji, betrayed them to their enemies as Kamakura. <laughs> I also appreciate having Goomba on the team, because anytime there was a, like, a strange Japanese name or like strange Japanese like phrase, I'm like, hey Goomba, how do you say this? Because he, uh, he uh, taught in Japan for a while. Um, he taught English in Japan for a while, so, you know, he had a, a much closer connection to the culture than, than I did. That's also why he tended to lean towards Japanese culture. Almost the entire clan, nearly 900 people, took their lives at their family temple to spare themselves the humiliating defeat. Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka got the idea to replicate the icon into Zelda, and there you go. If you're into Inuyasha, you may remember a character named Hocho Akitoki who, in story, represented one of the Hojo. Also, if you're into Total War Shogun 1 and or 2, okay. the Hojo clan was a playable faction. The Hojo family crest was called the Mitsu Uroko, huh. or the Three Dragon Scales, That's cool. meaning the protection of the Emperor. Much like the Triforce was a symbol that protected Hyrule, the Mitsu Uroko was a symbol that protected the Hojo clan. See? Like, and again, like, you know, it's... I actually didn't know that. So, and, and that's, again, one of the things that I really appreciated was the fact that you had these creators with their own perspectives on these games digging up stuff that you wouldn't think of otherwise, right? And I wouldn't know that. And it's it's cool to see people be able to talk about this. Oh, this always bothered me. It didn't bother me. I always noticed this whenever, uh, whenever I would review Goomba's videos. And back in the day, I had more time to watch all of them. But... Um, Anytime I would watch this, what it looks like a sheep's head up here. I don't exactly, I've never understood what that was supposed to be. Is that the top of the mountain? I don't know, it looks like a sheep. Japanese folklore monster known as Nurikabe. Now, Nurikabe are nasty little spirits. At night, they take the form of a wall and either trap or misdirect so fun. unfortunate It's travels. so cool. I love this. I love this. It's so fun. Like, hey, here's the wall spirit. Let's learn about the wall spirit. It's great. And, and again, gaming can be so educational for this stuff. So that's... That was his first ever Japanese culture in, in Kirby, Mario, and Zelda. I think my favorite of his was this one on uh, Pokemon names and how the different Pokemon, like the Japanese origins of Pokemon names, have completely different connotations about what the Pokemon are, which is cool. Um, but then, at a certain point, it became a culture shock because we wanted to test out a shorter format for it. Uh, I forget what exactly the impetus for that was. But I think, I think it was maybe like we were looking at watch time and we're like, hey, people are kind of falling off a little bit quicker. So let's just do like smaller, shorter hits of it, which then became Culture Shock. Hey, everyone. There's Patrick that boy. here. And welcome to the very first episode of Game Exchange Culture Shock Edition. Look, and his pixels, his sprite stand. Look at how much better this is. Two, and look, two years. So like, not bad where it went from this... 10 years ago to here two years. Research that I do for game exchange. Oh, often oh, and this is what his sprite originally looked like before it was, there's Gaijin Gamer, there it is, before it was game exchange. Uh, so that was the very, very first iteration of the show back when I saw it and, and I reached out to him being like, hey, come be a partner. Times find some really interesting cultural reference in a game, but it wouldn't be substantial enough to make a full Look, episode. Eat your heart around. out, YouTube. The, However, this, is, this isn't even short enough for YouTube shorts. <laughs> Darn it! I'm like, oh, we were there! <laughs> Cutting really edge! Fascinating information. And I figured instead of just dumping it all in the trash, I could start a sub series of quick two to three minute videos explaining these culture chunks. Oh, that's right. So basically, just a jolt of culture, if you catch that's my drift. That's right, it was, it was so like, to kick hey, off the first episode, let's dive focuses. back into one of my favorite scouring grounds for cultural references Mario. Specifically, Super Paper Mario for the Wii. Great game. In Chapter 6, you arrive at the Real Samurai weird. Kingdom inhabited by the Samurai Guys. Ever. It's fairly obvious that the level design and the names of the residents are leaning towards a reference to Japanese culture in general, but there is one reference yeah, involving this, these guys that is incredibly space. subtle, yet very powerful. After you complete the game, you have the option of participating in the Duel of 100 tournament. 
wherein you do battle with a hundred different samurai guys. What you probably didn't know is that this is a reference to a real-life event called the Hyakunin Kumite, or 100 person sparring. It's an event used in many martial arts in Japan as an ultimate test of mental and physical endurance, where one spars up against a hundred different opponents individually. And not against opponents of equal or lesser quality, mind you. Higher ranking members of the dojo will also act as opponents. The individual matches don't last longer than maybe two minutes, but that still means you're spending three to four hours sparring against multiple opponents. Between 1965 and 1999, cool. only 14 individuals from around the world were able to outlast their 100 opponents and complete the test. Nowadays, there's a 50 and 20 man variation of it, sure. but the 100 man Kumite- see, see, attention spans are getting shorter and uh, Japanese cultural fights are getting shorter. What is this world? <laughs> I want to spar against an increasing sequence of 100 enemies. Nope. This is, that's the tick, the, the 20 man, that's the TikTok version. The YouTube shorts version of the 100 man spar. Ah, we, get, we just got time for 20. Throw, you got five, just, we got five in the back. They'll just roll out, floss in your general direction. Give them, give them an old pat. Knock them out of the ring, it's fine. So, uh, Goomba, that's Goomba. Um, but you can see, like, it's amazing that, you know, we were able to see that evolution. Again, like, it was, it's so cool to see this evolution. Of, of them as creators and them just technically, their skill, f dialing in what their brand is and stuff. Uh, Goomba nowadays, I think still does, I think he uh, still has his Witch Ninja, which is a series that he started with us as a part of Culture Shock, um, or as a part of Game Exchange and now is over there. Uh, let's see, where is this uh, Goomba guy, Jin Goomba. Um, I saw, sorry, I got distracted, I saw, uh, I, I saw DHMAS and I'm like, ah! Oh! I, like, watch every video on DHMAS at this point. Uh, yeah, so he's still doing... Um, oh, this is 11 months ago, so that's a little bit older. Okay, he's doing... Oh, yeah. Talking about uh, the Japan opening or closing to tourists, which is, again, like, Japan is was always his focus. Like, I was the one who kind of encouraged him to try and, like, hey, we should try other cultures. I think your your series will do great to touch on, like... Russian culture and South American culture and this and that, because there's a lot of it. You know, Witcher is all steeped in, like, Polish folklore and stuff. Um, you know, but definitely his his interests and his personal passion was was Japan, because that's where his, you know, his teaching career and stuff had, had been. Uh, and he was always looking to get back there. And so, ah, Kami Booba. Great. <laughs> Team is like, I will say, <laughs> this, Kuma. <laughs> oh, if you, if, if you wanna, if you wanna blast from the past, Goomba got back. As, as uh, you know, that's it's a video, video left left to history. <laughs> different times, friends. Different times. Oh, uh, what's this one? What do we got? Ah, yeah, Ryder. Hello and welcome to another episode of a brief history. Today's episode: Five Nights at Freddy's. Ready, Ready set, set, go. Summer See. <laughs> I gotta show, maybe I'll show Austin. <laughs> maybe I'll show Austin this video. Be like, hey Austin, here's here's your intro sequence. This is it. <laughs> uh, so obviously uh, Ryder has been no stranger on the channel because he lives close to me and uh, he, he comes out and visits a lot. Uh, back when we were out in California, so uh, here we go. We're in the United States during the early 2010s. What can I say? It's a mysterious Nights, franchise. Right? Independent game developer Scott Cawthon creates and submits several titles to Steam Greenlight, including Sit and Survive, The Desolate Hope, and Chipper and Sons Lumber Corporation. However, the reception of these games from critics and players, particularly... Clearly, Chipper and Sons was incredibly negative, with many pointing out that all of Scott's characters looked terrifying and moved unnaturally, similar to animatronic no, not, puppets. Not a wrong These observation to make. <laughs> Let's be honest! And he was initially discouraged, he internalized the animatronic idea and decided to incorporate it into his next game. You see, YouTube commenters, negative comments only make us stronger. So Scott... <laughs> See, but okay, but Ryder, I mean, out of the gate, Ryder reached out to us to want to, he, he wanted to do a... Because his brief history, right? He would do games, uh, but he would also do, like, his favorite music acts, his favorite movies, uh, like Tim Burton movies, and then also YouTubers, right? He had a, a, which I think was smart, right? You have all these YouTube channels that rise and fall, and very few people are out there documenting those stories, right? Because I think it's one of those things that people have yet to really realize, like, hey this stuff can disappear with time or these big, big trends can be forgotten. And so I loved the concept of 
someone who was going out and serving as an archivist for these stories and and you know the interesting points in their in their journey, right? And Ryder, so Ryder reached out to us like, "Hey, can I do something on you guys or with you guys?" Uh, and I'm like, "Yes, but also let's bring that episode onto the channel because I think it's awesome." Let's bring your show onto the channel because I think it's awesome. And also, can you be an editor for us because your editing style, like, because he, I mean, he had sent us a very professional letter and and just like across the board, you could tell like, oh, he he gets it, um, like he cares, he's smart, and he he's working really hard. Um, and immediately, I'm like, oh, this is this is amazing. And so, yeah, edit for me. So I think he edited. What was it? The he'll tell you. And he's probably mentioned it on the couch a bunch of times. But it's what the the second ever Five Nights at Freddy's episode that we did. Um, and that was, I think, his first project with us. Which you know, it's a yeah, lot a lot of pressure there. Because he told me, um, was it uh, the the original the original um diner? He picked that one place from Gravity. Falls. Oh yeah, from Gravity Falls, and it's yeah. existed ever since. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. But but again, like yeah, he picked that and it's persisted in our episodes. What? How many years later? I mean, this is 5 years ago, so but you know, we we did that FNAF 2 episode and it's existed ever since. Um and it's and again, like you can already see he was he was the youngest of all of us, right? So he was a kind of like a not quite like a vine generation kid but also someone who grew up watching like he was the first person that i knew who's like i saw youtube i wanted to be a youtuber and and you know so i started teaching myself these skills i went to film school and i'm like well film school isn't gonna do it for you right because film school is teaching you movies youtube is a completely separate world than a lot of that um and what you're doing and what you're training yourself right now and is is the right direction and you can see like the pacing's different the editing's so much faster and more polished like you can start to see even 5 years ago how rider in a lot of ways was this kind of like push towards faster paced faster edited cram it all together and like move through it you know ready set go here we are we're off to the races um which i you know i i think is very much where we are now, except it's even faster, and there's even fewer pauses. One, on one hand, like, we were talking to him, and we were like, hey, it, it might not make sense for you to do this, but on the other hand, too, it, like, walking around his school, like, he'll, he's told me the story about, like, he, he just, no one got it. You know, no one at that time cared about YouTube, respected YouTube, had any interest in it, whatever, and so he's like, no, no, this is, this is cool, this is where it's at, and he's like, if you guys don't get it, clearly I'm not in the right place for me, so let me, let me move on. Um, so cool. I, so talented. He's, he's also, and let me, let me be clear, like, yes, his, his show is on our channel. He did, you know, brief histories on everything from Castlevania to PewDiePie to Sonic to FNAF, whatever, to us multiple times. Uh, I, I think he did two retrospectives on us. Uh, yeah, here's his first one. This was the first brief history of game theory. That was the one that he initially reached out to us. And then there was this guy, I think, which was the last one. I forget which one came first and which one came last. Um, it might have been the reverse. It might have been the reverse. But, uh, but yeah. But, like, super talented. But, again, like, not just... I guess I just, like, am drawn to musicians, too. Because Ryder, most talented musician you'll ever meet, he's redoing... He actually has redone the theme song for GT Live. We're just waiting on polishing up the intro right now. But we have a song. And the song's a banger. I love the song. Uh, he did the theme song for Food Theory. Um, he... He and I went to a concert over the weekend, and he's been teaching me everything about, like, classic electric guitar. So, like, Ryder, I, you could talk to him for hours. He's, he's so smart. He's, he's so brilliant. Uh, I love hanging out with him. And you can watch his stuff, because uh, uh, I know he just crossed a million subscribers um, of a ferret. So we've, again, this isn't a surprise. He's been on the channel, so this isn't anything like, oh, my gosh, where did, whatever happened to that guy? I, I mean, he... He was one who's like, hey, I think my, I would like to move on and do, you know, my own thing, really focus on my own work. And I'm like, that makes total sense. You absolutely should pursue, pursue your passions. And so he wanted to get into the animation community. He wanted to get into kind of his, his own animated storytelling. And here he is, you know, he's still doing, still doing great with his stuff. And he's still leaning into the map, I guess. But no, like, he's got his, his own series. And then he also launched his, what, Fofi channel earlier Fofi. this year Fofi which is uh like toy and card unboxing stuff which is great and that's not I mean for a brand new channel that literally launched a couple okay. months ago 
for it to be like 60k subscribers like it's amazing good for him i here's the thing true story i did you'll see that i don't subscribe to a lot of channels uh because subscription is such an antiquated way of using the platform at this point i youtube knows what you watch mm -hmm. and what videos you're going to be want to interested in and so basically there's a thing called virtual subscribers okay um and so for virtual subscribe like so i'm a virtual subscriber to a bunch of things even though i've never explicitly smashed the, the subscribe like they know that i'm subscribed to honest trailers and pitch meeting and a lot of those sorts of like film joke you know joke film channels or like film commentary channels never subscribe to any of them but every week it'll show up in my notification because i'm a virtual subscriber huh. so like subscription is a nice metric and like a nice like reminder to the system of like i really like this channel but you know if i'm searching for them regularly if i'm watching their videos they show up anyway so like i'm like yeah i, I forget to subscribe at this point i mean that's wow. honestly what it is it's like oh i'll uh, if i i like them youtube will send it back to me you know this is this is getting away from kind of the theory of the day uh, or the theme of the day, but I've suspected for a while that YouTube will one day phase out subscriptions because it is an antiquated metric. Huh. And you know, like I was talking to Jimmy, Mr. Beast, the other day after he crossed up 100 million subscribers, and he's like, "I'm like, hey, congrats! Uh, you know, you're pretty soon going to be number one channel. You know, one of his goals has always been to cro to be number one most subscribed YouTube channel." And so I'm like, you're, you're going to be there in no time. Um, and he's like, I don't care about that now. It's on to a billion. And I'm like, hello? Or yeah, yeah, a, a billion subscribers. And I'm like, could I see a world where that happens? Absolutely. But also I more so see a world where subscription as a metric on YouTube disappears before he can get there. Uh, I'm curious to see, one, if it just fades away entirely, or two if it becomes follow. Oh, interesting. Because, again, we'll, we'll get back to whoever's next. Oh, this is, okay, yep. We'll get back to Kerb for next. Yeah, um, sorry, I just was no, so no, 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 this is by the, the fact it's not like classic no, since, red. No, since this, is, since this is a nostalgic stream, I think this is, this is a fun thing to talk about, right? Yeah. So I've, so I've suspected for a while that subscription will disappear. Mm -hmm. I, but I also could see a world where it becomes follow Especially as YouTube, so it's always been a follow button. Sub to subscribe to a channel has never been like, I'm going to get every video. Talking to YouTube internally, they say it is a strong bookmark, basically. Yeah. It is a strong bookmark that says that this person has a high affinity, but their metrics show that just because you're subscribed to something doesn't mean you're going to watch everything. And so they just treat it as yet another signal that this person has some interest in it, which is why you might not see everything. That's why they instituted the bell for people who want to be notified of everything. You know, it's a different layer of subscription. It's a stronger signal to the system of saying, like, I want to hear everything from this person. As YouTube Shorts becomes more and more of a thing on the platform and becomes more and more prevalent and more and more of a priority, and more and more and more gen, as YouTube tries to court more and more of Gen Z or bring over more viewers from TikTok, I suspect that follow is a more accurate description of what that button does. It is more in line with social media at this point and, and especially like the TikTok stuff at this point. Anyway, go subscribe to Fofi and put up a ferret. Uh, moving on to, this is the shortest lived series. Uh, so much so that I wouldn't even call it a series, it was an individual video. Uh, this is from uh, Kerbifer, uh, Christopher Niosi. Uh, who has done a lot of work with a lot of different creators across the platform. Uh, he had this series called Tome. Uh, it's a scripted animated series. It appeared on Newgrounds is where I first discovered it, I believe, back in the day. You know, where now all you hip young kids would be playing, like, Friday Night Funkin'. Um, you know, and where you would find a lot of those early, like, flash animated cartoons and things like that. I wanted... Not only the game, like I, I wanted to experiment with a lot of things, but one of the things that I really wanted to do was figure out like a scripted series that could run on the channel as well, right? I'm like, oh, we're covering games and stuff. Like, let's have a scripted series on here too, which is just cool, high production value, you know, gets it onto YouTube rather than just being on uh, Newgrounds and kind of like the, the other sites. We have an audience here. Maybe they can build their own fandom. And so... So this video already existed in other places you've stepped into the virtual universe known as 
the terrain of magical expertise. Within this expansive interactive world, players of all ages, gender, and race from across the world unite together to a single community of social networking and gaming. With cool. So just skip ahead a little bit. Well, it's about time. This is episode one. I mean, look at this. This is great. I mean, you know, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. What do you, what do you mean? What, what, are, you, what are you talking about? About how you find screaming at the top of your lungs to be an effective opening attack. Don't tell me how to play my game. I mean, again, like I love watching all of this stuff. It's great. And the anime, and, and again, like you look at the same, it, it holds up so well. I think, at least. I don't know. Maybe maybe Ash being a, a, a youth feels differently. But to me, I look at it. Look at this. It reminds me of, like, Newgrounds. Yeah, I mean, it is. It's, it's Newgrounds, right? It's It's got that very clear aesthetic, that Flash animation style. But, like, so uh, how cinematic it is with these different shots and the angles. I, I thought it was awesome. And it, it had this kind of, like, cool lore to it. Even before the channel cared about lore. Um... You know, I thought it was very professionally done. I'm like, this this has a lot of legs. And I'm like, hey, again, you can't let me take it and put it on the channel so that way people can see it and you should be able to monetize better. The problem with this one, I, I very distinctly remember, and the reason it was only one episode uh, wasn't because of viewership or anything. It was because we immediately got a copyright flag on it. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think it was for the music. I think it was just... I, I don't know who copyright flagged it. I, I was so confused as to why. Because I'm like, here's Kerbifer. He is the one who made the series. I have emails with it. And I tried to email, you know, you can like appeal it in YouTube. I tried to send in emails. No, again, this was a very different time. This was, I mean, this was back in that 10 year ago range. And no one would listen. I'm like, here's the email of the creator himself saying, please distribute my thing. No one, I, I could not get this copyright uh, thing removed for him. Uh, and I'm like, I, I would love to continue hosting your series, but it looks like I'm not going to be able to get you any money for this because it just, this, there's some weird quirk in the system that I was both probably too inexperienced to deal with. Um, you know, that YouTube themselves weren't being responsive to creators at the time, and especially creators that were still kind of up and coming. Um, you know, I think at the time we probably had like maybe 30,000 subscribers or something. Uh, so like, you know, still relatively small potatoes, but but growing. Um, all of this stuff. And so it was one of those things where it was like, I, I want to do this for you. I want this to be awesome for you, uh, but I just can't do it. Uh, so that's why that was one a one-off episode. It ended immediately and then it disappeared. Uh, but I do know Curb, Curbofer game. He just did a tome video game, Train of Magical Expertise RPG, the game. Uh, a couple of years ago, he came onto the channel, uh, promoted it, his Kickstarter, and it worked. And I think we are actually cameo characters in it. The, so this is done, I believe, at this point. Um, there's a demo, but I believe, I'm not sure where you get it. Updates. Steam keys. Okay, so it's on Steam. Presumably. But yeah, he finished this, I believe, what, last year? So it is available right now, and we make a cameo in it. I'm not sure. I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet. Um, but it, it again, it takes Terrain of Magical Expertise, Tome, that series, which is great. It has this huge cast of characters, um, and it turns it into a full-on video game, uh, uh, like turn-based RPG game. 2D, but it's actually, I think, isn't it like 2.5D? Uh, but yeah, so there you go, friends. Uh, so if you want me and Steph and Goomba to be bosses in a video game and you want to play it, there it is, Tome. It's available, it is out there, and it's, it was a show that existed. So there you go. Awesome. Should I end there? I feel like this is a long series at this point. Yeah, this is a long... Right, this is a long, long episode. Yeah, and and I didn't expect to get onto a rant about the subscribe button and this and that. Yeah. But And there's still... Wow, there's still a lot left. So maybe... Maybe we hold off. Okay. Maybe we do a part two to this. Ooh. Because this is fun. This is fun. I don't know if you guys enjoy it, but I, I this has been really nice to think back on, on these times and, and how times have changed. Uh, old man YouTube over here. Big tall hair Matt Pat over here. No, this is, I mean, this is awesome. And I, and I think, you know, a lot of that early 
you, you see such a diversity in talent from the, the early creators and such a wealth of new ideas that are coming in. I think nowadays there's a pressure to perform and monetize, which pushes people to very specific types of videos. Um, I think the, the speed that you're expected to produce pushes people into a very specific type of video too, where it's like a lot of me talking on the couch and maybe like splicing other stuff. Whereas here it's like, there was animation. There was like, you had more time as a small creator to create extended intro sequences and, and animated characters and, and put them together. Now it's like, we gotta get that video out a week. Gotta get that video out a week. Um, and so it's, it started to kind of stifle a bit of the creativity that you were able to, to get away with here. Um, so it's awesome to see this. Uh, it's, I, I'm actually, coming into this, I didn't know what to expect. I, I thought that this would be a fun episode, a, a fun walk down memory lane, and it has been. But more so, I'm actually really impressed with how well a lot of this stuff holds up. Not, not all of it, obviously, and a lot of it's still rough around the edges, you know, like like Goomba figuring out his voice in that first game game exchange episode and like <laughs> some of the topic matters of like oh, we did a boobs episode and whatever like a lot of it hasn't necessarily aged super super well but a lot of it has and I'm it's it's one of the reasons why I love keeping up our earliest videos is because you see this narrative arc in who I've been as a creator and who the team has been as we've grown and expanded and, and gotten better at what we do and, and more refined in our craft, right? And I think that's an important story to tell. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you're just a hungry creator who has something that you want to say and something that you want to showcase or whatever, like, this is it, man. And, and hopefully you can find a place. Like, I, I'm hoping to get back to a point. And I, I've been thinking about this and hopefully at some point I, I'm able to figure it out. But I've been trying to figure out, like, how do we do this? game theorists in a way that doesn't hurt the channel because at this point like having a bunch of partner shows would hurt the channel unfortunately how do we still do that and give people a spotlight and give people a, a, a voice and give people a chance at an audience without you know because how do, how do we do that without necessarily having to like share channel space um so i don't know I mean, maybe it's more stuff like this, where we do more reaction stuff. To, I guess the, the live theory crafting to stuff like Harmony and Horror and Gemini, Gemini Home Entertainment and uh, Monument Mythos and stuff like that is a version of that, for sure, where we're like, hey, spotlighting this. Or like when we do a film theory on Bois Vert, and it's like, hey, that's a cool series. Like, that's awesome. I think that's a good way of doing it. But not everyone needs to have ARG, lore-packed, happy meat farm levels of, like, decrypting in order for us to like have to do that, right? So, I don't know, maybe it's it, maybe it's just a, like a one-off format that we do every once in a while, kind of like meme review, where it's like, hey, here's the stuff that we think is cool this month, or whatever. Or maybe there's a Game Theorist approved channel or something, I don't know, we'll see. I'd, I'd like to figure it out though, because I think it's important in this day and age where there is this pressure to like, everyone edit the same video because that's the thing that's riding the trend right now. You know, if there's a way to kind of like, hey, we all did this together, that'd be cool. So I ask you this question, yeah. everyone, and Matt. Oh, okay, yes. If you could make any kind of new gaming show, right? Like, any kind. Like, let's say you, viewer, you, hi. Um, wow, Ash is, Ash is breaking the wall. I'm breaking the wall The right wall now. has been shattered, Ash. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a very feeble wall. Pew! <laughs> Ah, crumble. Quiet but mighty. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's like the it's like the gun, the what the cricket in Men in Black, the TV <laughs> gun that like does the giant blast. Like whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Let's say you had the opportunity to have a partner show on the Game Theorists. Ooh. What show would you pitch, or what show would you make? Oh wow. So and even you, Matt. Let's say that if I had a partner show on the Game Theorists. <laughs> yeah. You can make a whole new game theory. The show. lore! We have the science and now we have the lore! <laughs> oh wait, that's just game theory at this point. Um, oh no, let me think about that. I, I mean, uh, the, the fortunate thing about being where I am and where we've been, right, is that I've gotten to make a lot of the stuff that I want to make. Yeah. You know, when for the longest time I wanted to make my version of Mythbusters and game theory was like my version of Mythbusters, but then... I got to actually, with YouTube Originals and Reality Check and, and the stuff that we got branded deals with, like, I was able to make 
the shows that I wanted to make, right? I was able to do a travel show in Japan in, in 360 VR. Uh, I wanted to make a debate show, you know, a gaming debate show, and I got to make that. Um, do I wish I could still make those, or do I wish that, you know, there was a platform for those to still exist? Absolutely. You know, like, I loved making all of those shows. The, the problem for me is that it's, it's, the, it's, the cost, it's, it's the cost of time, right? Like, I think right now there's so much going on in, in the channels between game theory, food theory, film theory, GT Live, other channels that might exist, the YouTube podcast thing that I'm working on. Like, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I'm working on, yeah. which is great, but it means that you can't say yes to every project all the time, right? And that certain projects have to fall by the wayside. And so I would love to say yes to more of those sorts of things or to be able to bring back some of those and just be like, this is just for fun as a retro nostalgia thing. It's just figuring out what that trade-off is, you know? There's, there's two limited resources in life. Mm -hmm. There's money and there's time. And at, at this point in the channel's life, you know, money, we can make a lot of the things that we want to make. Like, we're not going to go out and make a Mr. Beast. I gave away a million dollars. Like, that's a, like <laughs> that's not how, how we work. Um, that, that makes me super nervous. Um, nor do I really want to make that sort of thing. Like, I think, I think like, the St. Jude live streams are, like, the, like, if I'm doing a big live action thing, like, that's what I want to do. Like, that's really fun. It's a big live onstage performance. Um, but at this point, like, it really is time. Yeah. That is the problem. Time, manpower, finding the right people to help. So if you want to help, let us know. <laughs> um, or if you have a show to pitch, let us know down in the comments. Because, uh, you know, this, I, I, I love this. This has been fun. Um, so we'll, we'll cover the back half uh, later. So I think there's still, what is it, Drake we haven't talked about? We haven't talked about Lee. Uh, Lee's important to talk about. Uh, not, all of them are important to talk about. We didn't do digressing and side questing, which I think is very important to talk about. Um, personally, I think my all-time favorite partner show that we had. Um, am I forgetting? Am I forgetting anyone? I think that might be it. So anyway, more on the, the deep lore of, of the game theorists later. Uh, more walks down nostalgia lane. But uh, in the meantime, guys, thank you so much for empowering us on this journey over the last... 12 years and letting us be a platform for these amazing creators and, and so many more. Um, so thank you, because without you guys watching, we wouldn't be able to do that. So thank you for that. Thank you for subscribing and not just following. And as always, remember, it wasn't a live stream, but it was a video, a video for you. See ya!